my eighth brain surgery was supposed to be an outpatient procedure. And I still remember the day when my doctor walked into the pre-op waiting room and told me I would not be going home that day. In fact, I would not be going home that week. When the doctor left the pre-op waiting room, my family was quick to rush to my side. And they tried hard to make me feel better. It's just that the things they said were things like, look, God only gives you what you can handle. Or this, this is the next chapter in the book of your life. You just have to dare to write it. Or you, you are strong, you are resilient, you are going to be okay. One anonymous nurse even rolled up and she was like, girl, you are a warrior. I can already tell. I don't know how she felt like she knew this about me, but I tried hard to contain my eye roll. And look, don't get me wrong. My friends and my family, they are extraordinary. They never, ever let me suffer alone. It's just that they didn't know what to say to make me feel better. Nobody can make you feel better. It was then that I decided to text my friend Charlie. I met Charlie on the internet. And yeah, yeah, I know. But it's not weird. I met Charlie on Twitter. <laughs> Actually, where I met Charlie was in the brain tumor social media community he had co-created on Twitter. And I met him in person just before my second brain surgery. It was in Arizona, and so was Charlie. And he was there for me for every subsequent surgery. So when I texted him that day, he wrote back one simple line. I'm sorry, BB. That must really suck. Charlie didn't ask anything of me. He didn't urge me to be strong or promise me that I'd be okay. He just held space for me. Charlie sat in the shit with me. Because let me be clear, when you get a brain tumor at age 26, it's shitty. I've only actually met Charlie twice in person, once at brain surgery and once at my wedding. And I sort of love that he blows in for the big events. <laughs> Charlie's actually one of my life's greatest heroes. A few weeks later, I was walking through the hospital for my post-op appointment with my amazing husband, and I was stopped dead in my tracks as the elevator doors closed on this image. Every time her heart quit, she refused to. Hold up, y'all. Is that really what we meant to say? Is that really the message we are trying to give to sick people going up to see their doctors? That if your heart stops, you are a quitter. I ranted and, and raved to my husband about how unfair this was. And with this simple image, the hospital has so fervently neglected the power dynamics of who gets access to medical care and who doesn't, let alone the sheer lack of control we have over how and when we live or die. And I railed. And I railed against this idea that triumph was somehow the only way through trauma, or that triumph was somehow the only proof of a will to live. Mm-mm, nope. This is not a message for sick people. This, this is a message for well people. And I know this not because of my own trauma and suffering. I know this because I'm a trauma researcher. Fun, I know. <laughs> Actually, I'm a media researcher, and I fell into trauma by accident, or perhaps by empathy. It's just that every time I went online looking for research, I saw suffering, which says something very dark about me. <laughs> but what I think I actually saw was hope. People whose lives were broken by trauma reaching out for a hand to hold and reaching out to hold somebody else's hand. Because the one thing I've learned about trauma from roughly a decade of study is that traumas are those moments that break down our meaning-making schema. You know, the assumptions we have about the world I will wake up in the morning, I will go to work, I will make plans, I will come home, I will go to bed, I will do it all again. But when a traumatic rupture occurs, it marginalizes us. It makes us unable to exist in the world as we knew it. Trauma unmakes the world. So we, by force, by necessity, we become builders of the world. And no matter how hard we try, our worlds are never wholly built. 
Five years after my initial diagnosis, my parents sat me down to let me know that my sweet and beautiful mother had breast cancer. I could feel the fragile pieces of my world falling away. It was as though I could see them around me. And I walked through the world as a ghost until I could find a way to somehow, some way build a world that could account for cancer. Life doesn't really get any easier, and maybe it's not supposed to. But at this point in my life, everybody around me used the fact that I had not died of a brain tumor as proof that I was somehow resilient. And me and mom, we were going to be just fine. And I'd seen this before. This was familiar from my research. When we are traumatized, we are often told to overcome. And not just go back to normal or find a new normal, but to tap deep inside of ourselves, to use our pain and our trauma and our suffering to ignite some secret superpower always lurking deep within us, to become superheroes. Disability studies actually calls this idea the supercrip. And this isolating, insurmountable pressure to overcome is often caused by the purported politeness of others. Look, we're all told as kids not to stare, to look away from those who are different from us. But again, disability studies tells us that the reason we look away from the traumatized, sick, disabled, dare I say, monstrous body is because it reminds us of what we are afraid to become, what we will all become if we live long enough to see the ravages of age, disease, or the social world on our bodies. So we look away. And what happens when we tell people to overcome and then we look away from them? We tell them, no. You tell me that my pain, my suffering, my disease, or my circumstance, it is mine alone. And it is my responsibility to triumph so that I might inspire the well. Otherwise, the well just might not look at me. Not often, at least. And look. I tried hard to be normal. In fact, I tried to be a superhero. So hard did I try to be a superhero that roughly six weeks after brain surgery number one, I was standing in a CrossFit gym with my spinal fluid pouring out of my nose onto the ground. And for those of you who are not medical professionals, I will just let you know that that's not great. <laughs> so badly did I want to be a superhero that three days after being discharged from the ICU, I walked into a meeting dragging behind me like Linus, a pillowcase with an ice pack inside, and then I used that to ice my little head through the meeting. And that night, I went to the emergency room. Pain, reality, 10 brain surgeries, and acceptance set in. And with that acceptance, a recognition that maybe the way I was, maybe it was fine. And maybe my pain didn't have to belong only to me. And so maybe I didn't have to hide in it. Because the thing I believe is that suffering is social. Like all of the big things we experience in life, it is social, relational. Love is social. Joy is social. Pain is social. I know my pain because I can see your joy, and I know my sickness because I once knew wellness. And like all things that we know socially and relationally, there is a politics to it, a power to who we see and who we don't, and who we help and who we refuse to. But I believe that we can choose to see one another. We can choose to look directly at one another. That's right. It is okay to stare. And I believe we can change the stories we tell ourselves about trauma. And I believe that we can live not in spite of trauma, but with it, alongside it. And I believe that nobody, regardless of their pain, their suffering, their ability, their trauma is ever broken. So I believe we can sit in the shit with one another. <laughs> when I was first diagnosed with my brain tumor, my sister called me and she said, hey, you have got to grieve the life that you thought you would live. Only then will you be able to live the one you get. She couldn't fix my problem. Nobody could. She could sit in the shit with me. And that's what she did. They all did. My whole family, covered in shit, <laughs> silently holding space for me. I believe that resilience is more about becoming than overcoming. And I believe if we dare 
to get comfortable with our discomfort, to look directly at one another and know that maybe it's going to hurt and that's okay. Then the worlds that we build will be big and expansive with room for everybody. Every single kind of body. Look, yes, it is true. Trauma unmakes the world, and it is likely that none of us will get through unscathed. But then we, we get to be the builders of the world. So I leave you with one question. What kind of world do you want to rebuild? Thank you.